26 this morning. We're going to begin reading just a couple of verses in verse 1, Acts chapter 26. It says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. And Paul stretched forth a hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee judging all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee, hear me patiently. I want to take as kind of our, our, text, the, our text phrase this, this morning, speak for thyself. Has anyone ever told you, just speak for yourself? Maybe, maybe you've been talking and someone says, well, don't just repeat what you've heard. Talk for yourself. What has God done for you? And uh, this, this, this time, you know, Paul, he's been in prison. He's been in prison for preaching the gospel. And uh, he's finally given an opportunity to give a defense for why he's in prison. Uh, Festus was the one who heard him first and then, excuse me, Felix and then Fe Festus. And then King Agrippa hears about him and King Agrippa was very interested in Jewish customs. And he said, I want to hear this man, Paul. I want to hear his story. So he comes down and Paul is given one chance. What does he talk about? Well, I love what he talks about. He talks about the Lord. And it says, he says, speak for thyself. When a Christian stands up and speaks for himself, he's not speaking about himself. He's speaking about the Lord. It's a story about the Lord. And the Apostle Paul, he gives this story. He speaks for himself. And he gives his salvation testimony. Now, there are many different kinds of testimonies. For example, on Tuesday, and we're going to have a, a praise and testimony service. And we're going to just talk about the things that the God has done for us. But today we're going to talk about a salvation testimony. How did I come to know the Lord? You know, that's a very important thing. That's the best thing that ever can happen to a person. How do we come to know the Lord? And the Apostle Paul, he talks about this. You know, your testimony is the most powerful thing you have as far as giving the gospel outside of the gospel, outside of the word of God. Your testimony is the most powerful thing that you have. You know, we ought to give our testimony. And I love what, love what he says. He says, speak for thyself. Paul says, okay, I'm going to speak for myself. And, uh, you know, a lot of times it's easy to talk about so many different things, isn't it? Sometimes it's hard to talk about the Lord, even with those that we know and those that we love. How many of you ever know, know somebody that they could just tell a story? I mean, they could tell a story about anything. Maybe, maybe their face pops into your mind right at this moment as you think about that. I mean, they can make going to the grocery store sound exciting. I mean, they can talk just about anything. You know, I think about that sometimes. You know, I like we all have our hobbies, and we can talk about those things. I love thing, all things techie or cameras or whatever else. You know, I could talk all day about those things. But sometimes, you know, I can take all those times. I can waste so many opportunities talking about everything else instead of talking about the Lord. You know what I love just, just to make this emphasis? Paul, he had one opportunity. He said, I'm going to speak for the Lord. You know, I think about that. We're going into a holiday season. We're going to meet a lot of people we've never, we haven't seen in a while. We ought to treat this opportunity like Paul did. I have one opportunity. I'm not going to waste that. I'm going to speak for myself, not for me and not about me, but for the Lord. I'm going to speak about God to these people. And he gives his testimony. And this morning, I just want to talk about what is your story? How do I share my story? Paul, he had a purpose in doing this. And we'll come to that at the end here. So this morning, if you have your sheet there this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about what are some things that Paul used in his testimony. And then we're going to analyze how to give my testimony. And then we're going to actually practice it this morning. But number one, I want you to see in the scripture, look with me in verse 2. Paul says, I think myself happy. When it comes to giving our testimony, number one, speak with a happy spirit. You ever met somebody that was just, they were just mad all the time. I mean, they were just grumpy. Maybe, maybe they weren't a morning person. I don't know. But they were just always grumpy, mad at the world. They just, they just weren't happy. Can I say, if we're a Christian, we ought to be a happy Christian. Well, especially when we talk about the Lord. We ought, to, we ought to be happy about that. Do you think we have something to be happy about if we're a Christian? Yes. Amen. How many of you are glad you're not on your way to hell this morning? Amen. Hey, that's a great thing to be happy about. How many of you are glad that your sins are forgiven? Amen. Yeah, absolutely. How many of you are glad that Jesus is your Savior? Amen. Hey, we've got lots to be happy about. And when I think about speak with a happy spirit, the word that comes to mind is enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. That word actually comes from two words, and theos, which means in God. 
You know, when we speak about the Lord, we ought to have a divine enthusiasm. We ought to be happy about that. You know, we ought to have spent time thinking about the Lord that it just kind of wells up within us and it just kind of flows out of our life. When we speak about the Lord, there ought to be some excitement about it. We ought not to give our testimony. Well, I got saved about 20 years ago and, well, you know, my life's been different. You know, what? We ought to have some enthusiasm about that. Hey, Jesus saved me. I was going this way. I was on my way to hell, and Jesus saved me. That ought to give some excitement to that. Not put on, but there ought, there ought to be some joy in our life. We ought to get at least just a little bit excited about it when we talk about the Lord. So number one, speak with a happy, speak with a happy spirit. You know, I think some people, sometimes I think I, I, get, all, I get sidetracked trying to maybe outsmart people or debate people to Jesus Christ. Some people just need to hear a happy Christian talk about what God has done for them. You know, sometimes we don't need to match arguments and try to tie people into a philosophical pretzel and say, ha, my logic is better than yours. No, sometimes we need, they need to hear, hey, here's what God has done for me. You know, they can't argue against that. They can't argue against what Jesus has done in my life. And may, may God help us to speak with a happy Christian. You know, we ought to share our testimony Often. And it said Charles Spurgeon, he was the, how many of you know the name Charles Spurgeon when I say that? Okay. He was known as the Prince of Preachers. He was probably one of the most famous preachers that ever lived. The most famous preacher of the 19th century. It's estimated that he shared his, that he shared his personal testimonies in his sermons over 300 times. That's a lot of times. You know, he enjoyed speaking about the Lord. When I think about that, I ought to be so familiar and so comfortable with my testimony that I enjoy that. It just, it just kind of flows out of me. So number one, speak with a happy spirit. When we give our testimony, speak with a happy spirit. But number two, I want you to see, speak from the heart. Speak from the heart. Look with me in verse 9. Verse 9 of Acts chapter 26. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities." Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and then which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks." You know, what I, what I, you know what I appreciate about Paul's testimony here? Is he's standing, he's standing before the king and the governor and so many other people. But he, doesn't, he, he just speaks from the heart. He just shares what God has done in his heart. He doesn't give some doctrinal thesis about, well, let me talk to you about the substitutionary and vicarious atonement of Jesus Christ and about original sin. No, he's not trying to impress them with all these big fancy words that <clears throat> I don't hardly know what they mean. No, he's just talking about, hey, let me tell you what Jesus did in my heart. Let me tell you about what God did in my heart. He just simply tells them, King Agrippa, I was a sinner. I was a sinner. And then he, he goes on and he talks about, but Jesus saved me. Jesus saved me. I was blind in my own ways. But then Jesus turned my life around. He just, he speaks from the heart. You know, when we, when we talk with people, you know, our goal in giving our testimony is not try to impress them with how much we know, but just to speak from our heart. Hey, what has God done in your life? What does Jesus mean to you? And speak from the heart. Now, I think it's interesting. Paul, he's very organized when he does this. Sometimes when we think speak from the heart, we think just say whatever pops into our head. Sometimes that's not a good idea, is it? I know for me anyways. I don't know about you, but for me anyways, that's not a good idea. But Paul, he's very organized. And as we look at his testimony, we see Paul's very structured. He actually has three parts to his testimony. He has life before he got saved, before Christ, B.C., before Christ. Then he has the moment he got saved, and then he talks about life since he got saved. And we're going to talk about those things in just a few moments. Those are the three parts of a testimony below there. But Paul, he stays on track, and he speaks from the heart. And what I love about Paul, the way he gives his testimony, he doesn't get distracted. Sometimes, have you ever been telling a story, and you start telling the story, and you forgot 
what the point of the story was. Maybe you got halfway through. <laughs> okay, I'm guilty this morning. I've done that. Or maybe you're talking with someone and they're trying to tell you a story, but you just can't follow. I mean, they're over here. And then the next thing you know, they're all the way over here. And then they're over there. And you're just like, well, hold on a second. What are you talking about? You know, we tell our testimony. You know, we ought to, we, there ought to be a structure to it. And Paul, he gives, us, he gives us an example of life before we got saved. Paul just says, hey, I was a sinner. I needed Jesus. And then he talks about how he got saved. And then he talks about life since then. But he speaks from the heart. He just talks about what God has done in his heart. So number one, speak with a happy spirit. Number two, speak from the heart. But number three, speak about him. Speak about the Lord. You know, we all have a story to tell. But guess what? It's not your story. Did you know that? It's not your story. It's God's story. You see, my testimony is not the story of how I got saved. It's a story of how God saved me. And that may sound just like a different way to say that, but my story is not about me. It's about the Lord. You know, when I give my testimony, people all ought to leave thinking, wow, man, Brother Caleb, whew, I tell you what, he is something. No, no, I want them to think, wow, what a great Savior. What a great God. You know, when we, think of, when we think about that, that helps kind of focus our testimony. Sometimes we can get distracted and kind of lost in the details, and we can get way, way out talking about things. And, uh, you know, my testimony is not about me. It's about the Lord, and I have to remember that. You know, one of the things that we, can, that we can fall into is getting distracted by our sin and talking about our sin. Yeah, are we sinners? Absolutely, yes. So we declare our sinfulness, but we ought not to describe our sinfulness in great detail. For example, I've heard someone give a testimony, um, something like this, and I, they, were, they were very well-meaning, but, you know, they, they went on and on about their sin. Well, I did, I was in drugs, and let me tell you, it was every kind of drug imaginable. It, was, it wasn't just one. It was this, and it was this. I did everything. I lived an immoral lifestyle, and by that I mean everything. Okay, we ought not to glorify sin when we give our testimony. Our goal is not to make much of sin. It's to make much of Jesus. Make much of Jesus. So when we give our testimony, yes, we talk about our sin. And Paul, he says, hey, I persecuted people. I put them in jail. I killed Christians. But he just leaves it at that. But his goal is to get to Jesus, to talk about the Savior. So he doesn't get distracted talking about all these other things. He keeps it on point. Why? Because his testimony is about the Lord. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. So speak about him. That's the whole reason we're talking is it's about Jesus. When we think about that, I try to remember when I'm giving my testimony not to get distracted, even by the details. Sometimes we can get so caught up in, well, I went to the church and it was a beautiful sunny day. Oh, I think it was about 87 degrees that day. And I walked into the auditorium and they had blue carpet and red pews and they had uh, this up there and so-and-so was speaking, so-and-so was playing the piano. I think they played that hymn. You know, we can get so distracted by all those things. I'm being a little facetious this morning, just exaggerating it just a little bit. But you know, those are all nice things, but the goal is God. The goal is to bring people to Jesus. That's the whole reason I stand up and give my, my story. But it's not my story. It's God's story. And by the way, I better make sure I get the details right if it's his story. I better make sure I, I, I know what I'm talking about, understand these things. So number one, speak with a happy spirit. Number two, speak from the heart. Number three, speak about him. But number four, speak in the here and now. Look with me in verse 22. Paul says, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. He brings up present tense, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, should suffer and he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. He says, I continue unto this day. You know, the moment you got saved, you received eternal life. You know, salvation is not just something that happened 20 years ago, June the 5th, 1998. Salvation is not just past tense. By the way, salvation is also not just some future event for when I die. Salvation is present tense. When I got saved, when you got saved, Jesus came to live inside of you. The life of the eternal one lives inside of you. You have eternal life. If you're saved right now, today, you are living your eternal life. Does Jesus mean something to me now? Has Jesus taught me something at all since I've been saved? 
Perhaps, you know, I think about it, I have a life verse, or at least a seasonal verse. It changes from time to time. You know, God, he, he, he makes an emphasis on our life, and he teaches us. You know, when we share the gospel with people, they ought to see that salvation to me is not just some decision I made 20 years ago. It's not just something that's good only for when I die, but I need it right now. And God is changing my life right now. So when we, when we do that, we, we ought to help people understand. I like what Paul does. He gives them hope. He gives them hope, not just, for, not just for eternity, but for today. You know, some of the people we talk to, maybe they're down and out. They need to know about God's love, that God loves them, that their life has meaning. Well, we don't know what's going on in their life behind closed doors. You know, they need to know that God loves them. They need to have hope for today. What does Jesus do for me right now? You know, we all have some favorite verses. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Hey, those things can be, have such meaning. And so when we finish our testimony, this is one of the most neglected parts of a testimony is what does Jesus mean to me right now? Since I've been saved, how has Jesus changed my life? And so we ought to share some of those things. And Paul does that. So number four, speak in the here and now. Eternal life, salvation is a present possession. It's present tense. A good testimony is always present tense. Now look at number five. Look with me in verse 28. Look with me in verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, this famous verse, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You know what I think is interesting? King Agrippa, you know what he, when he heard Paul give his testimony, he realized, Paul, you're trying to persuade me to become a Christian. You know, what, you know what the purpose of our testimony is? So that someone else can know how they can get saved. That's the whole purpose of a testimony. When we give our testimony, number five, speak for a decision. Speak for a decision. Our goal is that after someone listening to my testimony, they can know exactly how they can become a Christian. That's so important. So Paul, he's, he's giving his story. He has this one chance. He gives his story how God reached down and saved him. And he's making appeal. He's trying to persuade Agrippa. Agrippa, we're not all that different. You have an interest in the things of, in Jewish history. Hey, that was me. Hey, I needed to get saved. King Agrippa, you need to get saved. Here's how you can do it. Here's how Jesus changed my life. Here's the difference it's made in my life. Here's how Jesus has changed me since then. And Paul, he speaks for a decision. That is the purpose of giving our, our, our salvation testimony. How, can, how did I get saved? But how can they get saved? And so when we think about that, you know, that helps, help us, helps keep us focused. So it trims a lot of things out, but it also makes sure that we put a lot of the right things in. So if someone needs to know how to get saved, what are some things they need to know in order to get saved? What do you think? What are some things they need to know if they're going to get saved? That they're a sinner. That they're a sinner. Amen. That's absolutely right. What is sin? Anything that displeases God. You know a great Bible verse? 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. What is sin? It's breaking God's law. You know, when I give my testimony, people ought to understand I'm a sinner. But not just that I say I'm a sinner. They ought to, they ought to understand, what does that mean? So I'm a sinner. That's a great thing we ought to tell somebody. What else do they need to know if they're going to get saved? Jesus died for them. Amen. They need to know the gospel, right? What, what is the gospel? Class, I think we've heard this a lot. Ready? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, if I give my, test, if I give my salvation testimony, do you think I ought to include the gospel? How, can I get saved without the gospel? No. So a salvation testimony without the gospel is incomplete. It's not a complete story. So when I give my testimony, I ought to talk about that. I ought to talk about those things, that Jesus died on the cross. He rose again. And you know what? Not just knowing those things, but believing those things, asking God to save me. I'd include all those things. If they're going to know how to get saved, they need to know they're a sinner. They need to know about the gospel. They need to know these things. And so we have to talk about that, those things. And by the way, it takes practice. Even though we know these things. Have you ever tried to say something and it just didn't come out right? I mean, you just kept trying and trying and trying. It just wasn't. You could just see the blank stare on their face. They just weren't getting it. You know, sometimes if, if, we, if we don't practice giving our testimony, um, we can look at the person. They're just kind of like their eyes glaze over a little bit. And they're, you can tell they're not getting it. And so we ought to practice those things. We'll practice those things in just a moment. But let's, so we've looked at Paul's testimony. Let's analyze our testimony. What are some practical things for get when we give our testimony? Is it a little warm in here to you all? Yes. Okay. 
Um, does someone know how to change the thermostats back there, Brother Marion? Thank you, sir. Okay, I'm glad to know it's not just me. I'm sweating up here too, so amen, amen. All right, but let's, let's go to our testimony. Number one, what's the first part? It's life before Christ. Life before Christ. The purpose of this part is, the goal of this part of the testimony is to relate to the person I'm speaking to and speak of our sinful condition. And so the two blanks under that are dis, dis, describe your background and declare your sinfulness. And the reason I have those is don't flip those around. Don't declare your background and then describe your sinfulness. It's not a testimony about my sin. It's a testimony about the Lord. And so it's okay to declare a background. Paul did that. He was trying to relate to the audience. You know, one of the things our testimony does is it builds a bridge to them. It says, hey, we're not that all that different. Hey, I'm a lot like you. I was a sinner. Guess what? You're a sinner too. I needed Jesus. Hey, guess what? You need Jesus too. So we're building that, but we're also defining sin. So when we, when we do this, when we talk about life before Christ, you know, all of our testimonies, they're all different, but guess what? They're all the same too. We may have different details about our life. Like I've heard some testimonies. Um, I think Miss Robin, she was driving over the James River Bridge. She got saved. I got saved in a church. You may have gotten saved in your, in your mother's bedroom. You may have gotten saved at your house or out at the grocery store or some other place. But you know, we all did the exact same thing. You know, we all came to an understanding that I'm a sinner. We all came to an understanding that I need Jesus. So we have all these details, but we want to make sure that they understand that I'm a sinner and I need Jesus. So number one, when we talk about our life before Christ, we want to make sure that we, we don't make too much of our sin, but we make much of Jesus. And the goal of this part is to relate to the audience, speak of our sinful condition. But number two, this is the most important part. The absolute most important part. How did you get saved? How you accepted Christ as your Savior? Number one, under that, make the gospel clear. We talked about that. We talked about, hey, we ought, to, we ought to define the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when I talk about the gospel, you know what? I shouldn't say, I shouldn't go get through the whole part beforehand and say, and then I went to church and I got saved. Amen. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, what does it mean to get saved? Um, you know, if I, tell, if I tell somebody I got saved, you know what? They might think that maybe I was drowning and someone pulled me out of a swimming pool. Or the house was burning and someone pulled me out. And uh, well, do they need to know exactly, well, what, what did I do? Some people might say, well, I prayed. That's great. What did you pray? What did you pray? What did you do? What did you know? We have to bring them along with us. A great rule of thumb is imagine you're speaking to a fifth grader who's never heard of Jesus. You know, in our world today, there's a lot of, there's a lot of biblical terminology, but people define things so many different ways. So when we, get, when we talk about the Lord, many times we have to redefine things for them. This is what the word getting saved means. This is what sin means. This is what the gospel means. A lot of people think of the gospel, it's a, isn't that a music genre? No, no, no. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we have, to, we have to work on that. So when we talk about how did I get saved, make the gospel clear. We ought to use those, we ought to use those words, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number two, use Bible themes like faith, love, and repentance. Use Bible themes. We ought to talk about faith. What does it mean to trust in Jesus? Not just knowing these things in our head, but have I trusted in Christ? Have I depended on Christ? You can even use a, an object illustration. I use the illustration of a chair. For example, I can say this pew will hold me up, but if I just talk about that and I don't actually sit down in the chair, do I really believe that that pew will hold me up? No, I don't. Not until I actually sit in the pure, sit on the chair, am I, am I exercising faith in that? I use that illustration all the time to illustrate faith. So we can, we can use certain things like that to, to help illustrate those things. Repentance, I was going this way towards my sin. Now I'm going this way towards the Lord Jesus. That's a complete turn. We can talk about the love of Jesus, that God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And we ought to talk about those things. Use Bible, use Bible themes. And one thing about that is define your terms. Like we said earlier, define your terms. So if you say, I got saved, make sure you define that. What does that mean? Um, so I try to say, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Some people even say, I prayed, to, I prayed to ask Jesus into my heart. 
You know, that's a great, that's a great term, but some people might even be confused by that. So even define that a little bit. What does that mean? And so just some of, the, some of these things. Make the gospel clear. Use Bible themes of love and repentance. And then, av- and then avoid terms that use religious jargon. Avoid terms that use religious jargon. I think I made a, I made a typo there. Avoid terms in religious jargon. This is the most important part. The most important part. They need to know how to get saved. And then life after Christ. Life after Christ. Salvation, remember, is always present tense. What does Jesus mean to you now? You know, a great thing to do is share a Bible verse. What is, a, what is your life verse? What, is, what does this verse mean to you? How has Jesus changed your life since then? Simply put, we ought to make the gospel appealing. They ought to see Jesus in me and say, I want what you have. I can see how Jesus has changed your life. I need that for me. So we ought, to, we ought to do those things. The goal of this part of the testimony is to show how Jesus changed your life. What does Jesus mean to you? So we've covered, we've covered a lot of things. I want to give you just a couple abbreviated examples of testimonies. I'm just making these up, by the way. I'm just making these up. And I want you to, I want you to listen. Is this a good testimony? And, if it's, and why is it good or is it bad? And uh, what if it is, well, not bad, excuse me. That's, that's bad to say. This, that's a bad testimony. No, no, no. What could be improved about that? What could be improved about that? So, for example, let's say I stand up and I'm giving, I've met you and I'm, I wanna, I'm telling you about the Lord and, and I begin to talk about, and I say, well, you know, I grew up, I grew up in church and, or let me, let me change it. I, I didn't grow up in church and, you know, I was, I was lost. My life was, my life was on the rocks. I hit rock bottom and a friend invited me to church. So I went to church and man, Jesus changed my life. And now I've been going to church and my life's been different ever since. Okay. Is that good or could it be better? Could it be better? What could be better about it? Get saved. Okay. Present the gospel. I didn't even mention the gospel, did I? Okay, what are some other things I can improve about that? More joyful? Good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, now I, 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 at that time, I didn't go through and say, well, I was into this sin and that sin and this sin and other things. Eric, how did, you get saved? how did I get saved? What did I do? You know, some people who say I got saved, they think you had a dream. Some people think lightning came down and struck your car while you were driving down the road, Okay. Did I, did I bow my head and pray? Did I ask Jesus? I ought to do that. And um, exactly. So we ought to make those things clear. And um, for sake of time, I want to try to give my testimony. And please, I'm not saying this is the perfect testimony. I've been trying to really work on how to give my testimony, especially after studying some of these things, especially standing up in front of all you all telling, this is how we ought to give a testimony. But I, I want to try to give, a, give my testimony. My testimony is similar to probably many of yours here. I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was a preacher. And so I grew up going to church. I, I had no choice. I had to go to church. I, w- I was drugged to church. And... Uh, And, you know, I grew up hearing all the Bible stories. I could, I mean, I could quote Bible verses. I could quote John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, I knew those verses. I knew for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I could quote you those verses as a six-year-old boy. I knew those things. And I knew, oh, everybody's a sinner. And I, I remember growing up, I, I knew those things. But you know what? Deep down inside, I didn't really believe them. You see, I knew those things. Oh, everybody's a sinner. But I still thought, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I haven't killed anybody. I haven't robbed any banks. I haven't done any drugs. I'm six years old. I can't really do any of those things anyways. <laughs> I haven't done any of those things. I'm the preacher's kid. I'm a pretty good person. But you know what? I knew about Jesus, but I never made it personal. I remember, one, I remember one Sunday morning, I was sitting in a church service. My dad was preaching. And I remember it just, it's like the Holy Spirit just turned the light on in my life. And I suddenly realized that it's not just everybody's a sinner. I'm a sinner. I've broken God's law. I've, I've done things that God has told me not to do. I've disobeyed my parents. I've said things I shouldn't have said. I've done things I shouldn't have done. And in that moment, I realized I'm a sinner. And I realized if I die right now, I'm on my way to hell. You know what? That thought terrified me. It scared me to death. I didn't want to die and go to hell. 
Uh, so I, I remember I, I, I finally understood that and it was personal. So when the, the preacher got to the end of the sermon and he said, if you're not saved but you want to get saved, you know you need to get saved, I want you to come forward. I made a beeline to the altar that Sunday morning. And my dad, he pulled me aside. He took me into a back room in the office. You know what he said? He, he gave me some of the same verses that I knew, that I quoted. Caleb, do you know you're a sinner? This time, oh, I shook my head, yes. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I'd broken God's law. He said, Caleb, Jesus loves you. God loves you so much that even though you're a sinner, Jesus died on the cross to save you. He paid the price for your sins. That's how much God loves you because he doesn't want you to die and go to hell. He wants to be your savior and he wants, to, he wants you to live forever in heaven with him. That's how much God loves you. Caleb, do you believe Jesus died on the cross, that he was buried, that he rose again for your sins? I shook my head, yes. Oh, I believe that. He said, you know what the Bible says, Caleb? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, Caleb, you can know about the Lord, but you have to ask him to save you. I remember that Sunday morning, I bowed my head. I prayed a simple prayer. I don't remember exactly the words that, that I prayed. By the way, the words aren't important. It's the prayer of the heart. But I prayed something like, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know if I died right now, I'd die and go to hell. But you died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. Dear Jesus, will you forgive my sin and be my savior? You know, at that moment, Jesus saved me. My life changed. The Holy Spirit came to indwell my life. You know, since then, God has he's taught me many wonderful things, and he's been with me. One of, one of my favorite verses in all the scripture is that there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, Proverbs 18. And growing up, you know, me and my brother, we're close. We're triplets. We're only two minutes apart. We're very close. But this verse, God is even closer than that. You know, there's been times when I've needed the Lord. And he's never left me, never forsaken me. And I'm thankful for the times of my life where God's got my attention and said, Caleb, you need me just as much today as then. And God's gotten a hold of my attention. I know God is with me and God has a plan for my life. And um, that's kind of an example of a testimony. And I mean those things. I'm not, I'm, I, even though I share my testimony as an example, I mean those things from my heart. That is one of my favorite Bible verses, by the way. And, uh, but when we give our testimony, people ought to know exactly how to get saved from that. And uh, by the way, if you're here this morning, you're not saved. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. You may be sitting in here and say, Brother Caleb, I don't have an experience like that. I've never asked Jesus to save me from my sins. Guess what? Today, you can do that. You can ask Jesus to save you. By the way, Lightning doesn't strike when you get saved. Bells don't ring. Lights don't flash. There's no magical feeling that comes over you. But Jesus comes into your life, and he changes you. And that produces a world of difference in your life. It's all the difference in your life. And uh, those are, that's an example of a testimony. Now, I want us to practice that this morning. So I want you to find a partner. I want everybody to find a partner. Um, so go ahead, look around. Everybody find a partner. I want everybody to find one. All right. Find a partner, someone sitting next to you. Josh, do you have a partner here, sir? All right, how about you partner up here with Attila here? Very good, very good. I want everybody to have a partner, all right? How many of you need a partner? All right, let me see. Caleb, I, I think we have a gentleman over here that might, that might need a partner. You could partner with him over there. Let's see, let's see. Very, very good. Let me see. Amen. All right. Very, very good. Brother Donnie, do you have a partner? Can I get you to come down and sit with Anthony and Brother, brother, brother Larry here? That would be great. That would be great. Oh, okay. I want everyone to find a partner. Turn to your partner and say, speak for thyself. <laughs> All right. Very good. All right. We're awake. We're alert. Alive, enthusiastic this morning. Amen. Okay. Take 10 seconds. Find a captain in your team. I'm a captain in your team. Our left one, if you're the captain, raise your hand. All right, very good. Captain, you're going to be silent first, okay? Partner, you're going to speak first, okay? Very good, very good. All right. You, Brother Donnie, you can speak first if you want. And what I want us to do is we're going to take about, I want you to take about 30 seconds to a minute, and I want you to just talk about life before you got saved. Remember, we're talking about, we're declaring our sinfulness. We're not describing it in great detail. Now, 
by the way, if God saved you from a life of drugs, it's okay to mention that. I'm not saying don't talk about that at all. We just don't want to glorify and exalt our sin. But it's okay to talk about that. Um, so remember, so those are the things. So we're going to talk about life before Christ. And we're going to take about 30 seconds, or actually we're going to take about a minute and do that. Ready? By the way, partner or captain, don't be too hard on them. Smile at them. They're doing their best. Okay. Smile at them. Be friendly. Okay. So, partner, you're speaking first. Ready and go. stop. All right. Captain, how'd they do? Good? Oh, you, got, you guys got an A+. Plus. A+, plus right there. Good. All right. Now we're going to switch it up. And now, Captain, it's your turn to speak. All right. We're going to take about one minute and do this. And just about part one, life before Christ. And yes, sir. I need more than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give the abbreviated version. All right. Amen. Amen. Yes, it is hard. It is hard to condense it into a minute. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. All right, ready and go. stop. Okay, that was part one of part three. How many of you felt maybe a little rusty? A little rusty on that? Okay. You know, the first couple times they do that, you may, you may almost feel slightly awkward. You're like, I haven't done this before. Hey, that's okay. Hey, it's something we work into, but we ought to get so familiar with it that it just it just wells up inside of us. It just flows right out of us. And, uh, you know, the more we do it, the more comfortable with it, whether we've got 25 minutes or whether you've got five minutes, we will be able to share our testimony. Some of you in here, by the way, you may not know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you're starting to talk and say, I don't have a story to tell. I don't have a story about how I got saved. Hey, you know what? I'm sure one of the people you're sitting there talking with, they'd be happy to share that with you and lead you to the Lord. And um, if that's you, be honest. Be honest with yourself. Don't, don't make up a story. If you're not saved, you can get saved today. We'd all rejoice with you. And uh, I, I, encourage you, I encourage you to do that. All right, now we're going to go to part two. All right, how you accepted Christ. Now, remember, when we talk about how, we're not talking about the color of the carpet or the building or the, the weather outside. We're talking about what happened. What did Jesus do? Why did I need to get saved? And get specific. Get very, very specific. What did you pray? What did you know? What was it that you believed? So, remember, talk about the gospel. So, amen. Okay, so this time, Captain, you go first. All right, part two, how... You accepted Christ as your Savior. Captain, ready and go.
All right, and stop. All right, and now, partner, it's your turn to speak. All right? Did the captain do a good job? All right, a lot of laughs. Oh, well, I don't know what to think about that. Amen. Okay. Well, partner, it is your turn to speak. Take about the next minute and a half, and you share how you accepted Christ as your Savior. And go. and stop all right and we're going to go to our last section life since jesus christ remember salvation is always present tense so we're answering the question what does jesus mean to me now so when we talk about the first part life before christ that's why do i need to get saved number two how did i get saved number three what does jesus mean to be right now so you can share maybe a bible verse or something that the lord has used in your life and maybe something that god has brought you through i would try to always share scripture even in a personal experience um, our experience is not the anchor of our faith the bible is experience merely backs merely backs up it's like the cherry on the top of what the bible already says so i would encourage you find a bible verse to share on that but life since christ what has jesus done in my life since what does jesus mean to me now and partner will let you go first this time all right ready and take about the next 90 seconds and go and stop okay and so now captain you get to finish things up all right so captain take about the next 60 to 90 seconds and share this time it's your turn to share what does jesus mean to you now what has he done in your life and go
All right, and stop. All right. You know, sometimes talking in a room like this, one on one, it can, it can feel a little bit, a little bit awkward. Maybe it's a little easier to do it um, with with someone else, but it's good. If you can do, if you can give your testimony to somebody you know and look them in the eye and deal deal with all of that, hey, guess what? You can share it with somebody else. And I think this is a great thing. We're going to eventually work on writing our testimony out, and uh, that's our homework assignment. Who knew you would get homework in Sunday school? All right. It is school, I guess, so maybe it's appropriate that we give out homework. Sunday school. On the back of your sheet, there are some blanks for you to fill out your testimony. I know for most of us, this is not enough room, but uh, it'll give us a good idea. Give us a good idea. Life before I got saved, how I accepted Christ as my Savior since I've been saved. And the reason I broke it up as we practice that this day, sometimes we, when we give our testimony, it's easy to make it really overly weighted on the front end, and then we have to rush through the back of it, okay, to get done in time. So I want us to think about all these three things. So take this home. I encourage you to write it out and think through it. And uh, no pastors talked about eventually we want to be able to, if you want to use this as your own personal soul winning track, we want to make that available to you. So write this out. And by the way, if you want to do that, please come talk to me. We, we can make that happen. And we're working on Pastor, Pastor Dan Gray's testimony in a tract form. But also, it, when you write things out and you think, it helps you to really think through it and know exactly how to say it and be very clear on that. And so I want, I want us to think about these things. And this Christmas season, Thanksgiving season, I encourage you, give, the, give your testimony. Give your salvation testimony to one person. At least one person. Find someone and do that. Make a point to do that. If we don't, if we don't do that, if we just say, oh, I'm just going to do it, and we don't get specific about it, we'll never do it, right? So let's, let's try to get specific about it. And I appreciate, I appreciate your attention today, and we're going to make some of these things available online. I think afterwards Pastor mentioned that. And uh, let's work on it, and I encourage you, give your, share your testimony with your children. That's a great thing to do, great thing to do. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer, and I think our service is going to start back in here in about 15 minutes. But take this home, write out your testimony, and bring it back next week, and our teachers will follow up on some of these things. All right? Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. Father, you are so good. Thank you that you are a father, that you love and you care for us. Thank you for saving me. Lord, I know I, I don't deserve it. None of us do. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, as we come into this worship meeting, Lord, draw our hearts to you. Lord, I pray that you would remove all distractions. Help us to focus completely on you so that we can receive all that you have for us. Be with the preacher. I pray that you would fill him with thy spirit. In Jesus' name.